Chapter 2 Judas and His Band Judas had not expected that his treason would have produced such fatal results. He had been anxious to obtain the promised reward and to please the Pharisees by delivering up Jesus into their hands, but he had never calculated on things going so far or thought that the enemies of his master would actually bring him to judgment and crucify him. His mind was engrossed with the love of gain alone, and some astute Pharisees and Sadducees with whom he had established an intercourse had constantly urged him on to treason by flattering him. He was sick of the fatiguing, wandering, and persecuted life which the apostles led. For several months past he had continually stolen from the alms which were consigned to his care, and his avarice grudging the expenses incurred by Magdalene when she poured the precious ointment on the feet of our Lord incited him to the commission of the greatest of crimes. He had always hoped that Jesus would establish a temporal kingdom and bestow upon him some brilliant and lucrative post in it. But finding himself disappointed, he turned his thoughts to amassing a fortune. He saw that sufferings and persecutions were on the increase for our Lord and his followers, and he sought to make friends with the powerful enemies of our Savior before the time of danger, for he saw that Jesus did not become a king, whereas the actual dignity and power of the high priest and all who were attached to his service made a very strong impression upon his mind. He began to enter by degrees into a close connection with their agents who were constantly flattering him and assuring him in strong terms that in any case an end would speedily be put to the career of our divine Lord. He listened more and more eagerly to the criminal suggestions of his corrupt heart, and he had done nothing during the last few days but go back and forth in order to induce the chief priests to come to some agreement. But they were unwilling to act at once and treated him with contempt. They said that sufficient time would not intervene before the festival day, and that there would be a tumult among the people. The Sanhedrin alone listened to his proposals with some degree of attention. After Judas had sacrilegiously received the blessed sacrament, Satan took entire possession of him, and he went off at once to complete his crime. He in the first place sought those persons who had hitherto flattered and entered into agreements with him, and who still received him with pretended friendship. Some others joined the party, and among the number Annas and Caiaphas, but the latter treated him with considerable pride and scorn. All these enemies of Christ were extremely undecided and far from feeling any confidence of success, because they mistrusted Judas. I saw the empire of hell divided against itself. Satan desired the crime of the Jews, and earnestly longed for the death of Jesus, the converter of souls, the holy teacher, the just man who was so abhorrent to him. But at the same time he felt an extraordinary interior fear of the death of the innocent victim, who would not conceal himself from his persecutors. I saw him then on one hand stimulate the hatred and fury of the enemies of Jesus, and on the other insinuate to some of their number that Judas was a wicked, despicable character and that the sentence could not be pronounced before the festival, or a sufficient number of witnesses against Jesus be gathered together. Everyone proposed something different, and some questioned Judas, saying, Shall we be able to take him? Has he not armed men with him? And the traitor replied, No, he is alone with eleven disciples. He is greatly depressed, and the eleven are timid men. He told them that now or never was the time to get possession of the person of Jesus, that later he might no longer have it in his power to give our Lord up into their hands, and that perhaps he should never return to him again, because for several days past it had been very clear that the other disciples and Jesus himself suspected and would certainly kill him if he returned to them. He told them likewise that if they did not at once seize the person of Jesus, he would make his escape and return with an army of his partisans, to have himself proclaimed king. These threats of Judas produced some effect. His proposals were acceded to, and he received the price of this treason, thirty pieces of silver. These pieces were oblong, with holes in their sides, strung together by means of rings and a kind of chain, and bearing certain impressions. Judas could not help being conscious that they regarded him with contempt and distrust, for their language and gestures betrayed their feelings, and pride suggested to him to give back the money as an offering for the temple, in order to make them suppose his intentions to have been just and disinterested. But they rejected his proposal, because the price of blood could not be offered in the temple. Judas saw how much they despised him, and his rage was excessive. 
He had not expected to reap the bitter fruits of his treason even before it was accomplished, but he had gone so far with these men that he was in their power, and escape was no longer possible. They watched him carefully, and would not let him leave their presence until he had shown them exactly what steps were to be taken in order to secure the person of Jesus. Three Pharisees accompanied him when he went down into a room where the soldiers of the temple, some only of whom were Jews and the rest of various nations, were assembled. When everything was settled and the necessary number of soldiers gathered together, Judas hastened first to the supper room, accompanied by a servant of the Pharisees, for the purpose of ascertaining whether Jesus had left, as they would have seized his person there without difficulty, if once they had secured the doors. He agreed to send them a messenger with the required information. A short time before, when Judas had received the price of this treason, a Pharisee had gone out and sent seven slaves to fetch wood with which to prepare the cross for our Savior, in case he should be judged, because the next day there would not be sufficient time on account of the commencement of the Paschal festivity. They procured this wood from a spot about three-quarters of a mile distant, near a high wall, where there was a great quantity of other wood belonging to the temple, and dragged it to a square situated behind the tribunal of Caiaphas. The principal piece of the cross came from a tree formerly growing in the valley of Josaphat, near the torrent of Cedron, and which, having fallen across the stream, had been used as a sort of bridge. When Nehemiah hid the sacred fire and the holy vessels in the pool of Bethsaida, it would have been thrown over this spot together with other pieces of wood, then later taken away and left on one side. The cross was prepared in a very peculiar manner, either with the object of deriding the royalty of Jesus or from what men might term chance. It was composed of five pieces of wood exclusive of the inscription. I saw many other things concerning the cross, and the meaning of different circumstances was also made known to me, but I have forgotten all that. Judas returned, and said that Jesus was no longer in the supper room, but that he must certainly be on Mount Olivet, in the spot where he was accustomed to pray. He requested that only a small number of men might be sent with him, lest the disciples who were on the watch should perceive anything and raise a sedition. Three hundred men were to be stationed at the gates and in the streets of Ophel, a part of the town situated to the south of the temple, and along the valley of Milo, as far as the house of Annas, on the top of Mount Sion, in order to be ready to send reinforcements if necessary, for he said all the people of the lower class of Ophel were partisans of Jesus. The traitor likewise bade them be careful, lest he should escape them, since he by mysterious means had so often hidden himself in the mountain, and made himself suddenly invisible to those around. He recommended them besides to fasten him with a chain, and make use of certain magical forms to prevent his breaking it. The Jews listened to all these pieces of advice with scornful indifference, and replied, If we once have him in our hands, we will take care not to let him go. Judas next began to make his arrangements with those who were to accompany him. He wished to enter the garden before them and embrace and salute Jesus, as if he were returning to him as his friend and disciple, and then for the soldiers to run forward and seize the person of Jesus. He was anxious that it should be thought they had come there by chance, that so when they had made their appearance he might run away like the other disciples and be no more heard of. He likewise thought that perhaps a tumult would ensue, that the apostles might defend themselves, and Jesus passed through the midst of his enemies, as he had so often done before. He dwelt upon these thoughts especially when his pride was hurt by the disdainful manner of the Jews in his regard. But he did not repent, for he had wholly given himself up to Satan. It was his desire also that the soldiers following him should not carry chains and cords, and his accomplices pretended to exceed all his wishes, although in reality they acted with him as with a traitor who was not to be trusted, but to be cast off as soon as he had done what was wanted. The soldiers received orders to keep close to Judas, watch him carefully, and not let him escape until Jesus was seized, for he had received his reward, and it was feared that he might run off with the money, and Jesus not be taken after all, or another be taken in his place. The band of men chosen to accompany Judas was composed of twenty soldiers, selected from the temple guard and from others of the military who were under the orders of Annas and Caiaphas. They were dressed very much like the Roman soldiers, had morions, crested metal helmets like them, and wore hanging straps round their thighs, but their beards were long, whereas the Roman soldiers at Jerusalem had whiskers only, and shaved their chins and upper lips. They had all swords, some of them being also armed with spears, and they carried sticks with lanterns and torches. But when they set off, they only lighted one. 
It had at first been intended that Judas should be accompanied by a more numerous escort, but he drew their attention to the fact that so large a number of men would be too easily seen, because Mount Olivet commanded a view of the whole valley. Most of the soldiers remained, therefore, at Ophel, and sentinels were stationed on all sides to put down any attempt which might be made to release Jesus. Judas set off with the twenty soldiers, but he was followed at some distance by four archers, who were only common bailiffs carrying cords and chains, and after them came the six agents with whom Judas had been in communication for some time. One of these was a priest and a confidant of Annas. A second was devoted to Caiaphas. The third and fourth were Pharisees, and the other two Sadduceans and Herodians. These six men were courtiers of Annas and Caiaphas, acting in the capacity of spies and most bitter enemies of Jesus. The soldiers remained on friendly terms with Judas until they reached the spot where the road divides the Garden of Olives from the Garden of Gethsemane, but there they refused to allow him to advance alone and entirely changed their manner, treating him with much insolence and harshness. Chapter 3 Jesus is Arrested Jesus was standing with his three apostles on the road between Gethsemane and the Garden of Olives when Judas and the band who accompanied him made their appearance. A warm dispute arose between Judas and the soldiers because he wished to approach first and speak to Jesus quietly as if nothing was the matter, and then for them to come up and seize our Savior, thus letting him suppose that he had no connection with the affair. But the men answered rudely, Not so, friend, thou shalt not escape from our hands until we have the Galilean safely bound. And seeing the eight apostles who hastened to rejoin Jesus when they heard the dispute which was going on, they, notwithstanding the opposition of Judas, called up four archers, whom they had left at a little distance, to assist. When, by the light of the moon, Jesus and the three apostles first saw the band of armed men, Peter wished to repel them by force of arms, and said, Lord, the other eight are close at hand, let us attack the archers. But Jesus bade him hold his peace, and then he turned and walked back a few steps. At this moment four disciples came out of the garden and asked what was taking place. Judas was about to reply, but the soldiers interrupted and would not let him speak. These four disciples were James the Less, Philip, Thomas, and Nathaniel. The last named, who was a son of the aged Simeon, had with a few others joined the eight apostles at Gethsemane, being perhaps sent by the friends of Jesus to know what was going on, or possibly simply incited by curiosity and anxiety. The other disciples were wandering to and fro on the lookout and ready to fly at a moment's notice. Jesus walked up to the soldiers and said in a firm and clear voice, Whom seek ye? The leaders answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Scarcely had he pronounced these words than they all fell to the ground as if struck with apoplexy. Judas, who stood by them, was much alarmed, and as he appeared desirous of approaching, Jesus held out his hand and said, Friend, whereto art thou come? Judas stammered forth something about business which had brought him. Jesus answered in few words, the sense of which was, It were better for thee that thou hadst never been born. However, I cannot remember the words exactly. In the meantime, the soldiers had risen and again approached Jesus, but they waited for the sign of the kiss, with which Judas had promised to salute his master that they might recognize him. Peter and the other disciples surrounded Judas and reviled him in unmeasured terms, calling him thief and traitor. He tried to mollify their wrath by all kinds of lies, but his efforts were vain, for the soldiers came up and offered to defend him, which proceeding manifested the truth at once. Jesus again asked, Whom seek ye? They replied, Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus made answer, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. At these words the soldiers fell for the second time to the ground, in convulsions similar to those of epilepsy, and the apostles again surrounded Judas and expressed their indignation at his shameful treachery. Jesus said to the soldiers, Arise. And they arose, but at first quite speechless from terror. They then told Judas to give them the signal agreed upon instantly, as their orders were to seize upon no one but whom Judas kissed. Judas therefore approached Jesus and gave him a kiss, saying, Hail, Rabbi. Jesus replied, What, Judas? Dost thou betray the Son of Man with a kiss? The soldiers immediately surrounded Jesus, and the archers laid hands upon him. Judas wished to fly, but the apostles would not allow it. They rushed at the soldiers and cried out, Master, shall we strike with the sword? 
Peter, who was more impetuous than the rest, seized the sword and struck Malchus, the servant of the high priest, who wished to drive away the apostles and cut off his right ear. Malchus fell to the ground, and a great tumult ensued. The archers had seized upon Jesus and wished to bind him, while Malchus and the rest of the soldiers stood round. When Peter struck the former, the rest were occupied in repulsing those among the disciples who approached too near and in pursuing those who ran away. Four disciples made their appearance in the distance and looked fearfully at the scene before them, but the soldiers were still too much alarmed at their late fall to tremble themselves much about them, and besides, they did not wish to leave our Savior without a certain number of men to guard him. Judas fled as soon as he had given the traitorous kiss, but was met by some of the disciples who overwhelmed him with reproaches. Six Pharisees, however, came to his rescue, and he escaped while the archers were busily occupied in pinioning Jesus. When Peter struck Malchus, Jesus said to him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot ask my father, and he will give me presently more than twelve legions of angels? How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that so it must be done? Then he said, Let me cure this man. And approaching Malchus, he touched his ear, prayed, and it was healed. The soldiers who were standing near, as well as the archers and the six Pharisees, far from being moved by this miracle, continued to insult our Lord, and said to the bystanders, It is a trick of the devil. The powers of witchcraft made the ear appear to be cut off, and now the same power gives it the appearance of being healed. Then Jesus again addressed them, You are come out, as it were, to a robber, with swords and clubs to apprehend me. I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you laid not hands upon me. But this is your hour, and the power of darkness. The Pharisees ordered him to be bound still more strongly, and made answer in a contemptuous tone, Ah, thou couldst not overthrow us by thy witchcraft. Jesus replied, But I do not remember his words, and all the disciples fled. The four archers and the six Pharisees did not fall to the ground at the words of Jesus, because, as was afterwards revealed to me, they, as well as Judas, who likewise did not fall, were entirely in the power of Satan, whereas all those who fell and rose again were afterwards converted and became Christians. They had only surrounded Jesus and not laid hands upon him. Malchus was instantly converted by the cure wrought upon him, and during the time of the Passion his employment was to carry messages back and forth to Mary and the other friends of our Lord. The archers who now proceeded to pinion Jesus with the greatest brutality were pagans of the lowest extraction, short, stout, and active with sandy complexions, resembling those of Egyptian slaves, and bare legs, arms, and neck. They tied his hands as tightly as possible with hard new cords, fastening the right-hand wrist under the left elbow and the left-hand wrist under the right elbow. They encircled his waist with a species of belt studded with iron points and bound his hands to it with osier bands, while on his neck they put a collar covered with iron points, and to this collar were appended two leathern straps, which were crossed over his chest like a stole and fastened to the belt. They then fastened four ropes to different parts of the belt, and by means of these ropes dragged our blessed Lord from side to side in the most cruel manner. The ropes were new. I think they were purchased when the Pharisees first determined to arrest Jesus. The Pharisees lighted fresh torches, and the procession started. Ten soldiers walked in front, the archers who held the ropes and dragged Jesus along followed, and the Pharisees and ten other soldiers brought up the rear. The disciples wandered about at a distance and wept and moaned as if beside themselves from grief. John alone followed and walked at no great distance from the soldiers until the Pharisees, seeing him, ordered the guards to arrest him. They endeavored to obey, but he ran away, leaving in their hands a cloth with which he was covered and of which they had taken hold when they endeavored to seize him. He had slipped off his coat that he might escape more easily from the hands of his enemies and kept nothing on but a short undergarment without sleeves and the long band which the Jews usually wore, and which was wrapped around his neck, head, and arms. The archers behaved in the most cruel manner to Jesus as they led him along. This they did to curry favor with the six Pharisees, who they well knew perfectly hated and detested our Lord. They led him along the roughest roads they could select, over the sharpest stones and through the thickest mire. They pulled the cords as tightly as possible. They struck him with knotted cords, as a butcher would strike the beast he is about to slaughter, and they accompanied this cruel treatment with such ignoble and indecent insults that I cannot recount them. The feet of Jesus were bare. He wore, besides the ordinary dress, a seamless woolen garment and a cloak which was thrown over all.
I have forgotten to state that when Jesus was arrested, it was done without any order being presented or legal ceremony taking place. He was treated as a person without the pale of the law. The procession proceeded at a good pace. When they left the road which runs between the Garden of Olives and that of Gethsemane, they turned to the right and soon reached a bridge which was thrown over the torrent of Cedron. When Jesus went to the Garden of Olives with the apostles, he did not cross this bridge, but went by a private path which ran through the valley of Josaphat and led to another bridge more to the south. The bridge over which the soldiers led Jesus was long, being thrown over not only the torrent, which was very large in this part, but likewise over the valley, which extends a considerable distance to the right and to the left, and is much lower than the bed of the river. I saw our Lord fall twice before he reached the bridge, and these falls were caused entirely by the barbarous manner in which the soldiers dragged him. But when they were half over the bridge, they gave full vent to their brutal inclinations, and struck Jesus with such violence that they threw him off the bridge into the water, and scornfully recommended him to quench his thirst there. If God had not preserved him, he must have been killed by this fall. He fell first on his knee and then on his face, but saved himself a little by stretching out his hands, which, although so tightly bound before, were loosened. I know not whether by miracle or whether the soldiers had cut the cords before they threw him into the water. The marks of his feet, his elbows, and his fingers were miraculously impressed on the rock on which he fell, and these impressions were afterwards shown for the veneration of Christians. These stones were less hard than the unbelieving hearts of the wicked men who surrounded Jesus and bore witness at this terrible moment to the divine power which had touched them. I had not seen Jesus take anything to quench the thirst which had consumed him ever since his agony in the garden, but he drank when he fell into the cedron, and I heard him repeat these words from the prophetic psalm, In his thirst he will drink water from the torrent. Psalm 108 The archers still held the end of the ropes with which Jesus was bound, but it would have been difficult to drag him out of the water on that side on account of a wall which was built on the shore. They turned back and dragged him quite through the cedron to the shore, and then made him cross the bridge a second time, accompanying their every action with insults, blasphemies, and blows. His long woolen garment, which was quite soaked through, adhered to his legs, impeded every movement, and rendered it almost impossible for him to walk. And when he reached the end of the bridge, he fell quite down. They pulled him up again in the most cruel manner, struck him with cords, and fastened the ends of his wet garment to the belt, abusing him at the same time in the most cowardly manner. It was not quite midnight when I saw the four archers inhumanly dragging Jesus over a narrow path, which was choked up with stones, fragments of rock, thistles, and thorns on the opposite shore of the Cedron. The six brutal Pharisees walked as close to our Lord as they could, struck him constantly with thick pointed sticks, and seeing that his bare and bleeding feet were torn by the stones and briars, exclaimed scornfully, His precursor, John the Baptist, has certainly not prepared a good path for him here. Or the words of Malachi, Behold, I send my angel before thy face to prepare the way before thee. Do not exactly apply now. Every jest uttered by these men incited the archers to greater cruelty. The enemies of Jesus remarked that several persons made their appearance in the distance. They were only disciples who had assembled when they heard that their master was arrested and who were anxious to discover what the end would be. But the sight of them rendered the Pharisees uneasy, lest any attempt should be made to rescue Jesus, and they therefore sent for a reinforcement of soldiers. At a very short distance from an entrance opposite to the south side of the temple, which leads through a little village called Ophel to Mount Sion, where the residences of Annas and Caiaphas were situated, I saw a band of about fifty soldiers who carried torches and appeared ready for anything. The demeanor of these men was outrageous, and they gave loud shouts both to announce their arrival and to congratulate their comrades upon the success of the expedition. This caused a slight confusion among the soldiers who were leading Jesus, and Malchus and a few others took advantage of it to depart and fly towards Mount Olivet. When the fresh band of soldiers left Ophel, I saw those disciples who had gathered together disperse. Some went one way and some another. The Blessed Virgin and about nine of the holy women, being filled with anxiety, directed their steps toward the valley of Josaphat, accompanied by Lazarus, John the son of Mark, the son of Veronica, and the son of Simon. The last named was at Gethsemane with Nathanael and the eight apostles, and had fled when the soldiers appeared. He was giving the Blessed Virgin the account of all that had been done when the fresh band of soldiers joined those who were leading Jesus, and she then heard their tumultuous vociferations and saw the light of the torches they carried. 
This sight quite overcame her. She became insensible, and John took her into the house of Mary, the mother of Mark. The fifty soldiers who were sent to join those who had taken Jesus were a detachment from a company of three hundred men posted to guard the gates and environs of Ophel, for the traitor Judas had reminded the high priests that the inhabitants of Ophel, who were principally of the laboring class and whose chief employment was to bring water and wood to the temple, were the most attached partisans of Jesus and might perhaps make some attempts to rescue him. The traitor was aware that Jesus had both consoled, instructed, assisted, and cured the diseases of many of these poor workmen, and that Ophel was the place where he halted during his journey from Bethania to Hebron, when John the Baptist had just been executed. Judas also knew that Jesus had cured many of the masons who were injured by the fall of the Tower of Silo. The greatest part of the inhabitants of Ophel were converted after the death of our Lord and joined the first Christian community that was formed after Pentecost. And when the Christians separated from the Jews and erected new dwellings, they placed their huts and tents in the valley, which is situated between Mount Olivet and Ophel, and there St. Stephen lived. Ophel was on a hill to the south of the temple, surrounded by walls, and its inhabitants were very poor. I think it was smaller than Dulman. The slumbers of the good inhabitants of Ophel were disturbed by the noise of the soldiers. They came out of their houses and ran to the entrance of the village to ask the cause of the uproar. But the soldiers received them roughly, ordered them to return home, and in reply to their numerous questions, said, We have just arrested Jesus, your false prophet, he who has deceived you so grossly. The high priests are about to judge him, and he will be crucified. Cries and lamentations arose on all sides. The poor women and children ran backwards and forwards, weeping and wringing their hands, and calling to mind all the benefits they had received from our Lord. They cast themselves on their knees to implore the protection of heaven. But the soldiers pushed them on one side, struck them, obliged them to return to their houses, and exclaimed, What farther proof is required? Does not the conduct of these persons show plainly that the Galilean incites rebellion? They were, however, a little cautious in their expressions and demeanor for fear of causing an insurrection in Ophel, and therefore only endeavored to drive the inhabitants away from those parts of the village which Jesus was obliged to cross. When the cruel soldiers who led our Lord were near the gates of Ophel, he again fell, and appeared unable to proceed a step farther, upon which one among them, being moved to compassion, said to another, You see, the poor man is perfectly exhausted. He cannot support himself with the weight of his chains. If we wish to get him to the high priest alive, we must loosen the cords with which his hands are bound, that he may be able to save himself a little when he falls. The band stopped for a moment, the fetters were loosened, and another kind-hearted soldier brought some water to Jesus from a neighboring fountain. Jesus thanked him, and spoke of the fountains of living water, of which those who believed in him should drink. But his words enraged the Pharisees still more, and they overwhelmed him with insults and contumelious language. I saw the heart of the soldier who had caused Jesus to be unbound, as also that of one who brought him water, suddenly illuminated by grace. They were both converted before the death of Jesus and immediately joined his disciples. The procession started again and reached the gate of Ophel. Here Jesus was again saluted by the cries of grief and sympathy of those who owed him so much gratitude, and the soldiers had considerable difficulty in keeping back the men and women who crowded round from all parts. They clasped their hands, fell on their knees, lamented, and exclaimed, Release this man unto us! Release him! Who will assist? Who will console us? Who will cure our diseases? Release him unto us! It was indeed heartrending to look upon Jesus. His face was white, disfigured, and wounded, his hair disheveled, his dress wet and soiled, and his savage and drunken guards were dragging him about and striking him with sticks like a poor dumb animal led to the slaughter. Thus was he conducted through the midst of the afflicted inhabitants of Ophel, and the paralytic whom he had cured, the dumb to whom he had restored speech, and the blind whose eyes he had opened, united but in vain, in offering supplications for his release. Many persons from among the lowest and most degraded classes had been sent by Annas, Caiaphas, and the other enemies of Jesus to join the procession and assist the soldiers both in ill-treating Jesus and in driving away the inhabitants of Ophel. The village of Ophel was seated upon a hill, and I saw a great deal of timber placed there ready for building. The procession had to proceed down a hill and then pass through a door made in the wall. On one side of this door stood a large building erected originally by Solomon, and on the other the Pool of Bethsaida. After passing this, they followed a westerly direction down a steep street called Milo, 
at the end of which a turn to the south brought them to the house of Annas. The guards never ceased their cruel treatment of our divine Savior and excused such conduct by saying that the crowds who gathered together in front of the procession compelled them to severity. Jesus fell seven times between Mount Olivet and the house of Annas. The inhabitants of Ophel were still in a state of consternation and grief when the sight of the Blessed Virgin who passed through the village accompanied by the holy women and some other friends on her way from the valley of Cedron to the house of Mary, the mother of Mark, excited them still more, and they made the place re-echo with sobs and lamentations while they surrounded and almost carried her in their arms. Mary was speechless from grief and did not open her lips after she reached the house of Mary, the mother of Mark, until the arrival of John, who related all he had seen since Jesus left the supper room. And a little later she was taken to the house of Martha, which was near that of Lazarus. Peter and John, who had followed Jesus at a distance, went in haste to some servants of the high priest with whom the latter was acquainted, in order to endeavor by their means to obtain admittance into the tribunal where their master was to be tried. These servants acted as messengers, and had just been ordered to go to the houses of the ancients and other members of the council to summon them to attend the meeting which was convoked. As they were anxious to oblige the apostles, but foresaw much difficulty in obtaining their admittance into the tribunal, they gave them cloaks, similar to those they themselves wore, and made them assist in carrying messages to the members in order that afterwards they might enter the tribunal of Caiaphas and mingle without being recognized among the soldiers and false witnesses, as all other persons were to be expelled. As Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and other well-intentioned persons were members of this council, the apostles undertook to let them know what was going to be done in the council, thus securing the presence of those friends of Jesus whom the Pharisees had purposely omitted to invite. In the meantime, Judas wandered up and down the steep and wild precipices at the south of Jerusalem, despair marked on his every feature, and the devil pursuing him to and fro, filling his imagination with still darker visions and not allowing him a moment's respite. The procession started again and reached the gate of Ophel. Here Jesus was again saluted by the cries of grief and sympathy of those who owed him so much gratitude, and the soldiers had considerable difficulty in keeping back the men and women who crowded round from all parts. They clasped their hands, fell on their knees, lamented, and exclaimed, Release this man unto us! Release him! Who will assist? Who will console us? Who will cure our diseases? Release him unto us! It was indeed heartrending to look upon Jesus. His face was white, disfigured, and wounded, his hair disheveled, his dress wet and soiled, and his savage and drunken guards were dragging him about and striking him with sticks like a poor dumb animal led to the slaughter. Thus was he conducted through the midst of the afflicted inhabitants of Ophel, and the paralytic whom he had cured, the dumb to whom he had restored speech, and the blind whose eyes he had opened, united but in vain, in offering supplications for his release. Many persons from among the lowest and most degraded classes had been sent by Annas, Caiaphas, and the other enemies of Jesus to join the procession and assist the soldiers both in ill-treating Jesus and in driving away the inhabitants of Ophel. The village of Ophel was seated upon a hill, and I saw a great deal of timber placed there ready for building. The procession had to proceed down a hill and then pass through a door made in the wall. On one side of this door stood a large building erected originally by Solomon, and on the other the Pool of Bethsaida. After passing this, they followed a westerly direction down a steep street called Milo, at the end of which a turn to the south brought them to the house of Annas. The guards never ceased their cruel treatment of our divine Savior and excused such conduct by saying that the crowds who gathered together in front of the procession compelled them to severity. Jesus fell seven times between Mount Olivet and the house of Annas. The inhabitants of Ophel were still in a state of consternation and grief when the sight of the Blessed Virgin who passed through the village accompanied by the holy women and some other friends on her way from the valley of Cedron to the house of Mary, the mother of Mark, excited them still more, and they made the place re-echo with sobs and lamentations while they surrounded and almost carried her in their arms. Mary was speechless from grief and did not open her lips after she reached the house of Mary, the mother of Mark, until the arrival of John, who related all he had seen since Jesus left the supper room. And a little later she was taken to the house of Martha, which was near that of Lazarus. 
Peter and John, who had followed Jesus at a distance, went in haste to some servants of the high priest with whom the latter was acquainted, in order to endeavor by their means to obtain admittance into the tribunal where their master was to be tried. These servants acted as messengers, and had just been ordered to go to the houses of the ancients and other members of the council to summon them to attend the meeting which was convoked. As they were anxious to oblige the apostles, but foresaw much difficulty in obtaining their admittance into the tribunal, they gave them cloaks, similar to those they themselves wore, and made them assist in carrying messages to the members in order that afterwards they might enter the tribunal of Caiaphas and mingle without being recognized among the soldiers and false witnesses, as all other persons were to be expelled. As Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and other well-intentioned persons were members of this council, the apostles undertook to let them know what was going to be done in the council, thus securing the presence of those friends of Jesus whom the Pharisees had purposely omitted to invite. In the meantime, Judas wandered up and down the steep and wild precipices at the south of Jerusalem, despair marked on his every feature, and the devil pursuing him to and fro, filling his imagination with still darker visions and not allowing him a moment's respite. Chapter 4 Means Employed by the Enemies of Jesus for Carrying Out Their Designs Against Him No sooner was Jesus arrested than Annas and Caiaphas were informed and instantly began to arrange their plans with regard to the course to be pursued. Confusion speedily reigned everywhere. The rooms were lighted up in haste, guards placed at the entrances, and messengers dispatched to different parts of the town to convoke the members of the council, the scribes, and all who were to take a part in the trial. Many among them had, however, assembled at the house of Caiaphas as soon as the treacherous compact with Judas was completed, and had remained there to await the course of events. The different classes of ancients were likewise assembled, and as the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians were congregated in Jerusalem from all parts of the country for the celebration of the festival, and had long been concerting measures with the council for the arrest of our Lord, the high priest now sent for those whom they knew to be the most bitterly opposed to Jesus, and desired them to assemble the witnesses, gather together every possible proof, and bring all before the council. The proud Sadducees of Nazareth, of Capharnaum, of Thirza, of Gabara, of Jatapata, and of Silo, whom Jesus had so often reproved before the people, were actually dying for revenge. They hastened to all the inns to seek out those persons whom they knew to be enemies of our Lord, and offered them bribes in order to secure their appearance. But with the exception of a few ridiculous calumnies, which were certain to be disproved as soon as investigated, nothing tangible could be brought forward against Jesus, excepting indeed those foolish accusations which he had so often refuted in the synagogue. The enemies of Jesus hastened, however, to the tribunal of Caiaphas, escorted by the scribes and Pharisees of Jerusalem, and accompanied by many of those merchants whom our Lord drove out of the temple when they were holding market there as also by the proud doctors whom he had silenced before all the people, and even by some who could not forgive the humiliation of being convicted of error when he disputed with them in the temple at the age of twelve. There was likewise a large body of impenitent sinners whom he had refused to cure, relapsed sinners whose diseases had returned, worldly young men whom he would not receive as disciples, avaricious persons whom he had enraged by causing the money which they had been in hopes of possessing, to be distributed in alms. Others there were whose friends he had cured, and who had thus been disappointed in their expectations of inheriting property. Debauchees, whose victims he had converted, and many despicable characters who made their fortunes by flattering and fostering the vices of the great. All these emissaries of Satan were overflowing with rage against everything holy, and consequently with an indescribable hatred of the Holy of Holies. They were further incited by the enemies of our Lord, and therefore assembled in crowds round the palace of Caiaphas to bring forward all their false accusations and to endeavor to cover with infamy that spotless Lamb who took upon Himself the sins of the world and accepted the burden in order to reconcile man with God. Whilst all these wicked beings were busily consulting as to what was best to be done, anguish and anxiety filled the hearts of the friends of Jesus, for they were ignorant of the mystery which was about to be accomplished, and they wandered about sighing and listening to every different opinion. Each word they uttered gave rise to feelings of suspicion on the part of those whom they addressed, and if they were silent, their silence was set down as wrong. 
Many well-meaning but weak and undecided characters yielded to temptation, were scandalized, and lost their faith. Indeed, the number of those who persevered was very small indeed. Things were the same then as they oftentimes are now. Persons were willing to serve God if they met with no opposition from their fellow creatures, but were ashamed of the cross if held in contempt by others. The hearts of some were, however, touched by the patience displayed by our Lord in the midst of His sufferings, and they walked away silent and sad. Chapter 5 A Glance at Jerusalem The customary prayers and preparations for the celebration of the festival being completed, the greatest part of the inhabitants of the densely populated city of Jerusalem, as also the strangers congregated there, were plunged in sleep after the fatigues of the day, when all at once the arrest of Jesus was announced, and everyone was aroused, both his friends and foes, and numbers immediately responded to the summons of the high priest, and left their dwellings to assemble at his court. In some parts the light of the moon enabled them to grope their way in safety along the dark and gloomy streets, but in other parts they were obliged to make use of torches. Very few of the houses were built with their windows looking on the street, and generally speaking their doors were in inner courts, which gave the streets a still more gloomy appearance than is usual at this hour. The steps of all were directed toward Sion, and an attentive listener might have heard persons stop at the doors of their friends and knock in order to awaken them, then hurry on, then again stop to question others, and finally set off anew in haste toward Sion. Newsmongers and servants were hurrying forward to ascertain what was going on, in order that they might return and give the account to those who remained at home, and the bolting and barricading of doors might be plainly heard, as many persons were much alarmed and feared an insurrection, while a thousand different propositions were made and opinions given, such as the following, Lazarus and his sisters will soon know who is this man in whom they have placed such firm reliance. Joanna, Chusa, Susanna, Mary the mother of Mark, and Salome will repent, but too late, the imprudence of their conduct. Seraphia, the wife of Sirach, will be compelled to make an apology to her husband now, for he has so often reproached her with partiality for the Galilean. The partisans of this fanatical man, this inciter of rebellion, pretended to be filled with compassion for all who looked upon things in a different light from themselves, and now they will not know where to hide their heads. He will find no one now to cast garments and strew olive branches at his feet. Those hypocrites who pretended to be so much better than other persons will receive their deserts, for they are all implicated with the Galilean. It is a much more serious business than was at first thought. I should like to know how Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea will get out of it. The high priests have mistrusted them for some time. They have made common cause with Lazarus, but they are extremely cunning. All will now, however, be brought to light. Speeches such as these were uttered by persons who were exasperated, not only against the disciples of Jesus, but likewise with the holy women who had supplied his temporal wants and had publicly and fearlessly expressed their veneration for his doctrines and their belief in his divine mission. But although many persons spoke of Jesus and his followers in this contemptuous manner, yet there were others who held very different opinions, and of these some were frightened, and others being overcome with sorrow sought friends to whom they might unburden their hearts, and before whom they could without fear give vent to their feelings. But the number of those sufficiently daring openly to avow their admiration for Jesus was but small. Nevertheless, it was in parts only of Jerusalem that these disturbances took place, in those parts where the messengers had been sent by the high priests and the Pharisees to convoke the members of the council and to call together the witnesses. It appeared to me that I saw feelings of hatred and fury burst forth in different parts of the city, under the form of flames, which flames traversed the streets, united with others which they met, and proceeded in the direction of Zion, increasing every moment, and at last came to a stop beneath the tribunal of Caiaphas, where they remained, forming together a perfect whirlwind of fire. The Roman soldiers took no part in what was going on. They did not understand the excited feelings of the people, but their sentinels were doubled, their cohorts drawn up, and they kept a strict lookout. This indeed was customary at the time of the Paschal Solemnity, on account of the vast number of strangers who were then assembled together. The Pharisees endeavored to avoid the neighborhood of the sentinels for fear of being questioned by them and of contracting defilement by answering their questions. The high priests had sent a message to Pilate intimating their reasons for stationing soldiers round Ophel and Sion, 
but he mistrusted their intentions, as much ill-feeling existed between the Romans and the Jews. He could not sleep, but walked about during the greatest part of the night, hearkening to the different reports and issuing orders consequent on what he heard. His wife slept, but her sleep was disturbed by frightful dreams, and she groaned and wept alternately. In no part of Jerusalem did the arrest of Jesus produce more touching demonstrations of grief than among the poor inhabitants of Ophel, the greatest part of whom were day laborers, and the rest principally employed in menial offices in the service of the temple. The news came unexpectedly upon them. For some time they doubted the truth of the report and wavered between hope and fear. But the sight of their master, their benefactor, their consoler, dragged through the streets, torn, bruised, and ill-treated in every imaginable way filled them with horror. And their grief was still further increased by beholding his afflicted mother wandering about from street to street, accompanied by the holy women, and endeavoring to obtain some intelligence concerning her divine Son. These holy women were often obliged to hide in corners and under doorways for fear of being seen by the enemies of Jesus. But even with these precautions they were oftentimes insulted and taken for women of bad character. Their feelings were frequently harrowed by hearing the malignant words and triumphant expressions of the cruel Jews, and seldom, very seldom, did a word of kindness or pity strike their ears. They were completely exhausted before reaching their place of refuge, but they endeavored to console and support one another, and wrapped thick veils over their heads. When at last seated, they heard a sudden knock at the door, and listened breathlessly. The knock was repeated, but softly, therefore they made certain that it was no enemy, and yet they opened the door cautiously, fearing a stratagem. It was indeed a friend, and they eagerly questioned him, but derived no consolation from his word. Therefore, unable to rest quiet any longer, they issued forth and walked about for a time, and then again returned to their place of refuge, still more heartbroken than before. The majority of the apostles, overcome with terror, were wandering about among the valleys which surround Jerusalem, and at times took refuge in the caverns beneath Mount Olivet. They started if they came in contact with one another, spoke in trembling tones, and separated on the least noise being heard. First they concealed themselves in one cave, and then in another. Next they endeavored to return to the town, while some of their number climbed to the top of Mount Olivet, and cast anxious glances at the torches, the light of which they could see glimmering at and about Zion. They listened to every distant sound, made a thousand different conjectures, and then returned to the valley, in hopes of getting some certain intelligence. The streets in the vicinity of Caiaphas' tribunal were brightly illuminated with lamps and torches, but as the crowds gathered around it, the noise and confusion continued to increase. Mingling with these discordant sounds might be heard the bellowing of the beasts which were tethered on the outside of the walls of Jerusalem, and the plaintive bleeding of the lambs. There was something most touching in the bleeding of these lambs, which were to be sacrificed on the following day in the temple. The one lamb alone, who was about to be offered a willing sacrifice, opened not his mouth, like a sheep in the hands of the butcher, which resists not or the lamb which is silent before the shearer, and that lamb was the lamb of God, the lamb without spot, the true paschal lamb, Jesus Christ himself. The sky looked dark, gloomy, and threatening. The moon was red and covered with livid spots. It appeared as if dreading to reach its full because its creator was then to die. Next I cast a glance outside the town, and near the south gate I beheld the traitor Judas Iscariot, wandering about, alone, and a prey to the tortures of his guilty conscience. He feared even his own shadow, and was followed by many devils who endeavored to turn his feelings of remorse into black despair. Thousands of evil spirits were busying themselves in all parts, tempting men first to one sin and then to another. It appeared as if the gates of hell were flung open and Satan madly striving and exerting his whole energies to increase the heavy load of iniquities which the Lamb without spot had taken upon himself. The angels wavered between joy and grief. They desired ardently to fall prostrate before the throne of God and to obtain permission to assist Jesus. But at the same time they were filled with astonishment and could only adore that miracle of divine justice and mercy which had existed in heaven for all eternity. And now was about to be accomplished. For the angels believe, like us, in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, who began on this night to suffer under Pontius Pilate, and the next day was to be crucified, to die and be buried, descend into hell, rise again on the third day, ascend into heaven, be seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from thence come to judge the living and the dead. They likewise believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Chapter 6 Jesus Before Annas It was towards midnight when Jesus reached the palace of Annas, and his guards immediately conducted him into a very large hall, where Annas, surrounded by twenty-eight counselors, was seated on a species of platform, raised a little above the level of the floor, and placed opposite to the entrance. The soldiers who first arrested Jesus now dragged him roughly to the foot of the tribunal. The room was quite full between soldiers, the servants of Annas, a number of the mob who had been admitted, and the false witnesses who afterwards adjourned to Caiaphas's hall. Annas was delighted at the thought of our Lord being brought before him, and was looking out for his arrival with the greatest impatience. The expression of his countenance was most repulsive, as it showed in every lineament not only the infernal joy with which he was filled, but likewise all the cunning and duplicity of his heart. He was the president of a species of tribunal instituted for the purpose of examining persons accused of teaching false doctrines, and if convicted there, they were then taken before the high priest. Jesus stood before Annas. He looked exhausted and haggard. His garments were covered with mud, his hands manacled, his head bowed down, and he spoke not a word. Annas was a thin, ill-humored-looking man with a scraggly beard. His pride and arrogance were great, and as he seated himself he smiled ironically, pretending that he knew nothing at all, and that he was perfectly astonished at finding that the prisoner, whom he had just been informed was to be brought before him, was no other than Jesus of Nazareth. "'Is it possible,' said he, "'is it possible that thou art Jesus of Nazareth? Where are thy disciples, thy numerous followers? Where is thy kingdom?' I fear affairs have not turned out as thou didst expect. The authorities, I presume, discovered that it was quite time to put a stop to thy conduct, disrespectful as it was towards God and his priests, and to such violations of the Sabbath. What disciples hast thou now? Where are they all gone? Thou art silent. Speak out, seducer. Speak out, thou inciter of rebellion. Didst thou not eat the paschal lamb in an unlawful manner? at an improper time, and in an improper place? Dost thou not desire to introduce new doctrines? Who gave thee the right of preaching? Where didst thou study? Speak! What are the tenets of thy religion? Jesus then raised his weary head, looked at Annas, and said, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither all the Jews resort, and in secret I have spoken nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them who have heard what I have spoken unto them. Behold, they know what things I have said. At this answer of Jesus, the countenance of Annas flushed with fury and indignation. A base menial who was standing near perceived this, and he immediately struck our Lord on the face with his iron gauntlet, exclaiming at the same moment, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus was so nearly prostrated by the violence of the blow that when the guards likewise reviled and struck him, he fell quite down, and blood trickled from his face onto the floor. Laughter, insults, and bitter words resounded through the hall. The archers dragged him roughly up again, and he mildly answered, If I have spoken evil, give testimony of the evil. But if well, why strikest thou me? Annas became still more enraged when he saw the calm demeanor of Jesus, and turning to the witnesses, he desired them to bring forward their accusations. They all began to speak at once. He has called himself king. He says that God is his father, that the Pharisees are an adulterous generation. He causes insurrection among the people. 
He cures the sick by the help of the devil on the Sabbath day. The inhabitants of Ophel assembled around him short time ago and addressed him by the titles of Savior and Prophet. He lets himself be called the Son of God. He says that he is sent by God. He predicts the destruction of Jerusalem. He does not fast. He eats with sinners, with pagans, and with publicans, and associates with women of evil repute. A short time ago he said to a man who gave him some water to drink at the gates of Ophel that he would give unto him the water of eternal life, after drinking which he would thirst no more. He seduces the people by words of double meaning, etc., etc. These accusations were all vociferated at once. Some of the witnesses stood before Jesus and insulted him while they spoke with derisive gestures, and the archers went so far as even to strike him, saying at the same time, Speak! Why dost thou not answer? Annas and his adherents added mockery to insult, exclaiming at every pause in the accusations, This is thy doctrine, then, is it? What canst thou answer to this? Issue thy orders, great king. Man sent by God, give proofs of thy mission. Who art thou? continued Annas in a tone of cutting contempt. By whom art thou sent? Art thou the son of an obscure carpenter? Or art thou Elias, who was carried up to heaven in a fiery chariot? He is said to be still living, and I have been told that thou canst make thyself invisible when thou pleasest. Perhaps thou art the prophet Malachi, whose words thou dost so frequently quote. Some say that an angel was his father, and that he likewise is still alive. An impostor as thou art could not have a finer opportunity of taking persons in than by passing thyself off as this prophet. Tell me, without further preamble, to what order of kings thou dost belong? Thou art greater than Solomon, at least thou pretendest to be so, and dost even expect to be believed. Be easy, I will no longer refuse the title and the scepter which art so justly thy due. Annas then called for the sheet of parchment about a yard in length and six inches in width. On this he wrote a series of words in large letters, and each word expressed some different accusation which had been brought against our Lord. He then rolled it up, placed it in a little hollow tube, fastened it carefully on the top of a reed, and presented this reed to Jesus, saying at the same time with a contemptuous sneer, Behold the scepter of thy kingdom! It contains thy titles, as also the account of the honors to which thou art entitled, and thy right to the throne. Take them to the high priest, in order that he may acknowledge thy regal dignity, and treat thee according to thy deserts. Tie the hands of this king, and take him before the high priest. The hands of Jesus which had been loosened were then tied across his breast in such a manner as to make him hold the pretended scepter, which contained the accusations of Annas, and he was led to the court of Caiaphas, amidst the hisses, shouts, and blows lavished upon him by the brutal mob. The house of Annas was not more than three hundred steps from that of Caiaphas. There were high walls and common-looking houses on each side of the road, which was lighted up by torches and lanterns placed on poles, and there were numbers of Jews standing about talking in an angry, excited manner. The soldiers could scarcely make their way through the crowd, and those who had behaved so shamefully to Jesus at the court of Annas continued their insults and base usage during the whole of the time spent in walking to the house of Caiaphas. I saw money given to those who behaved the worst to Jesus by armed men belonging to the tribunal, and I saw them push out of the way all who looked compassionately at him. The former were allowed to enter the court of Caiaphas. Chapter 7 The Tribunal of Caiaphas To enter Caiaphas's tribunal, persons had to pass through a large court, which may be called the exterior court. From thence they entered into an inner court, which extended all round the building. The building itself was of far greater length than breadth, and in the front there was a kind of open vestibule, surrounded on three sides by columns of no great height. On the fourth side the columns were higher, and behind them was a room almost as large as the vestibule itself, where the seats of the members of the council were placed on a species of round platform raised above the level of the floor. That assignment to the high priest was elevated above the others. The criminal to be tried stood in the center of the half-circle formed by the seats, the witnesses and accusers stood either by the side or behind the prisoner. There were three doors at the back of the judge's seats, which led into another apartment, filled likewise with seats. 
This room was used for secret consultation. Entrances placed on the right and left-hand sides of this room opened into the interior court, which was round, like the back of the building. Those who left the room by the door on the right-hand side saw on the left-hand side of the court the gate, which led to a subterranean prison excavated under the room. There were many underground prisons there, and it was in one of these that Peter and John were confined a whole night, when they had cured the lame man in the temple after Pentecost. Both the house and the courts were filled with torches and lamps, which made them as light as day. There was a large fire lighted in the middle of the porch, on each side of which were hollow pipes to serve as chimneys for the smoke, and round this fire were standing soldiers, menial servants, and witnesses of the lowest class who had received bribes for giving their false testimony. A few women were there likewise, whose employment was to pour out a species of red beverage for the soldiers, and to bake cakes, for which services they received a small compensation. The majority of the judges were already seated around Caiaphas, the others came in shortly afterwards, and the porch was almost filled between true and false witnesses, while many other persons likewise endeavored to come in to gratify their curiosity, but were prevented. Peter and John entered the outer court in the dress of travelers, a short time before Jesus was led through, and John succeeded in penetrating into the inner court by means of a servant with whom he was acquainted. The door was instantly closed after him, therefore Peter, who was a little behind, was shut out. He begged the maid servant to open the door for him, but she refused both his entreaties and those of John, and he must have remained on the outside had not Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who came up at this moment, taken him with them. The two apostles then returned the cloaks which they had borrowed, and stationed themselves in a place from whence they could see the judges, and hear everything that was going on. Caiaphas was seated in the center of the raised platform, and seventy of the members of the Sanhedrin were placed around him, while the public officers, the scribes, and the ancients were standing on either side, and the false witnesses behind them. Soldiers were posted from the base of the platform to the door of the vestibule through which Jesus was to enter. The countenance of Caiaphas was solemn in the extreme, but the gravity was accompanied by unmistakable signs of suppressed rage and sinister intentions. He wore a long mantle of a dull red color, embroidered in flowers and trimmed with golden fringe. It was fastened at the shoulders and on the chest, besides being ornamented in the front with gold clasps. His head attire was high and adorned with hanging ribbons, the sides were open, and it rather resembled a bishop's mitre. Caiaphas had been waiting with his adherents belonging to the great council for some time, and so impatient was he that he rose several times, went into the outer court in his magnificent dress, and asked angrily whether Jesus of Nazareth was come. When he saw the procession drawing near, he returned to his seat.